Hey guys, in today's video I want to talk about Packards and specifically the 1940 to 1942 356 engine. That engine was sort of a lineage from the Packard 120 engine that they introduced in 1935 and also its brothers of 110 and 115 six-cylinder engines that they introduced in 1937. Packard was suffering greatly, probably more so than other manufacturers because they were a premium brand. And we've got to remember, in 1932, 33, 34 were terrible, desperate economic times in America. Packard knew in order to compete that they had to come out with a less expensive product. So in 1935, they introduced the Packard 120. Well, it was a big success. Uh, surprisingly, it was well accepted into the marketplace as a Packard product. Well, it drove great. It was lighter. It supposedly put out 110 horsepower. We've seen a little bit greater than that. I kind of think that the engine was slightly detuned. So it was really a great engine. And so it transformed into the 1940 356 engine, which was just a bigger version of that engine. Supposedly puts out 160 horsepower. And with just a couple of changes, they ran that same engine up to 1954. So let's explore how they were built. Are they good? Are they bad? Did Packard make the right decision? Let's run them through the dyno and check it out and see. This is our project, 1942 Packard 180 formal sedan. Came in to us about 10 years ago and has been on the very, very slow track of restoration and it has all, everything to do with the owner. He's sailing around the world having the time of his life on, a, on his boat. So uh, life is good for him and he's in no hurry for his Packard. But it's a fairly conventional car. Um, nothing really terribly outstanding for the day. Um, the underneath the hood is packed full of stuff because you have a different kind of starting mechanism. You push the gas all the way to the floor and then it starts. You have uh, all kinds of different little things here that are packed in there um, that have to be dealt with uh, as far as a restoration. But when we get underneath the, the body and into the chassis, really it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. What Packard did is they introduced the independent front suspension in 1935 and they carried that into the 40 Packards, the 160 180s, and it has an X-member frame. It's quite a bit lighter than the than the big uh, Super 8 and 12 frames that uh, preceded it. So uh, lightness is great, and uh, I think they really succeeded because this car rides exceedingly well. The um, the engine is mounted like typical like Packard engines were with a mount in the front, there's a bar going up and over in the front, and then it also had transmission mounts in the back and stabilizers uh, in between. The front end is a Packard owned design. It's got coil springs and it's got this like kingpin member out there and then it's got a trailing arm, which again was introduced in 1935. Then in 1937, the senior cars adopted it and they carried this same design right in uh, to the 1940-42 year and, and even beyond that same design because it worked really well. So, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Manifolding was pretty much a standard thing with a downdraft carburetor, a Carter carburetor on this particular model, and uh, worked extremely well. The steering in it was a, uh, a center pivot design. Again, carry over from uh, 35, clear on up through the senior car started in 37, and uh, this car has the same and it worked very well. A lot of cars had the same thing, uh, Cords even used uh, a center pivot steering design. Uh, gas tank mounted in the back, of course, and uh, open drive shaft. It's the Packard uh, Hypoid uh, gear setup so that they could get the whole thing lower. See the gear, the drive shaft is down toward the bottom, not not in the middle of the pumpkin in the back. Well, when we dive into the engine directly, we've got a, a nine main bearing engine. And uh, that's pretty typical for Packard. All their Super 8s and everything were 9 main bearing. And when you get the crank out of them, they tend to be a wet noodle. So it really needed all those 9 main bearings uh, for support. A few little cheesy things that they did, like the oil pickup uh, was pop metal. 
Well, this is not the greatest idea in the world, but I guess they were trying to economize after all. It was a very competitive world. But all in all, underneath, the crankshaft was really a great design. They had um, the removable weights, and you have to remove those weights. If you don't, uh, you won't be able to grind the whole journal because it overhangs the rod journal. So we have to drill them out, and then we... Um, uh, go ahead and grind the crankshaft. We harden them. We nitrite them and harden them, and uh, that way the the modern insert bearings are uh, are are much better to ride on that hard surface. The um, uh, weights then have to be put back on, and then the whole assembly has to be balanced. A really nice feature of the uh, the 356 engine is they had hydraulic lifters. And this wasn't anything that was really brand new. Cadillac used this same kind of lifter in 1937 on the flathead engines. They powered so many tanks during World War II. Uh, Pierce Arrow used uh, the same kind of lifter. Um, a lot of the manufacturers were adopting hydraulic lifters by this time. Lincoln did in their V12s. Um, of course, Packard had their own design in, in the V12s. Uh, Cadillac and their overhead valve V12, V16 engines had a hydraulic lifter, so this was nothing terribly new. Um, a lot of manufacturers were using Lincoln, Cadillac, Pierce Arrow. Uh, so many of them were using hydraulic lifters by this time uh, that it was nothing terribly new, but it was, it was really important to get the engines super quiet. You had to have hydraulic lifters in them. In this particular engine, we had some trouble with the insert bearings. And when you buy a set of insert bearings for these, which you don't have to pour the bearings and line bore them like we do on some of the other cars and a lot of the earlier cars, we have to do that because you can't get inserts. Well, you can buy them for this car, but they come in a white plain box. You have no idea who makes them. Uh, quality is usually good, but on this particular engine, it had a drag in it, and we could not figure out why. Our measurements were perfect. We like two thousandths on rods and mains. We were right on the money. It's like, what in the world is going on with this engine? So we ended up uh, taking all the bearings and bluing them, putting it back together again and find out what the heck is going on. And this is what was happen happening. Normally on an insert bearing at the parting line, you have a greater gap than you do opposite of the parting line. So uh, we, we discovered it when we blew it out is look at this, it's rubbing on the party, parting line. Well, what can you do about that? You certainly can't put it in a line boring machine and, and fix that that way. So the only thing we could do is hand scrape them out and hand fit them at the parting line. And then once we did that, it was just absolutely perfect. We use uh, Arius Pistons, which is now CP Carrillo. That's what's in this thing. They're, they really work well. We've been using them for 35 years or so. So um, it's, uh, it works good. There's something that's uh, really nice about these this design engine from Packard is it has an external oil pump. So if you have any problems with the oil pump, you know, there it is. It's really, it's really a smart idea. Um, so, uh, normal cast, one, one piece cast in block, L head design, two valves per cylinder, you know, it's pretty standard stuff, but it really it works well. So then once we got it assembled, it was off to the dyno, and uh, you get all the probes and everything hooked up, and we start them up, and we start breaking them in. And what that means is, is that we run them, and we see how it's idling, and then we'll give a little gas and we'll get a little RPM and we'll just kind of keep breaking it in like that for an hour, two hours. So while we're doing that, let's talk about what a dyno does. A dyno is simply a water pump, a big water pump in this case, it's a 10 horsepower pump that is fighting against the engine through these rotors called brake rotors. So you've got the engine on the stand, it's got a drive shaft hooked up to the engine and the other side is to these, these um, rotors. And in there, there are veins and water is flowing in there. And so as you rev up the engine, that water starts pumping those, those veins. And to put a load on the engine, 
This electric motor kicks into the equation when you turn it on, and when you start revving the engine up in RPM with whatever setting you put on your RPM, that electric motor through a variable speed drive will start to load that engine down and try to hold it at whatever that setting is. And in our case, we like 1500 RPM. So as the engine increases in RPM, the electric motor is holding it back. It has this big tank of water and it's pushing against the engine and it's holding there. We like to do sweep up test. And the only reason why is because that's where we started and now I can compare all the engines the same if I just keep doing sweep up tests. So then what we do is we start letting that electric motor uh, lower its RPM so that it starts the engine revving up in RPM. So it's sort of analogous to you're driving a car and you're going up a hill. You keep pushing the gas down, keep pushing the gas down because you want to hold your speed. And you're sort of holding that speed with full throttle going up the hill. Then you top the hill and you start going down the other side and you've got that full throttle and then you get up to max RPM, you're going to back off the throttle. It's exactly what we're doing on the dial. So we're uh, measuring that torque, calculating that horsepower off of climbing that hill. So we'll do that for, well, it's usually somewhere around 10 poles, maybe 15, sometimes it's seven poles. And then we notice that each pole is exactly the same or virtually exactly the same as, as it was in the previous ones. So at that point, the engine's pretty much broken in. We don't have any improvement to do unless we do tuning. So that means uh, timing, carburation, distributor points, gaps, you know, all that kind of stuff. And we can dial it in. But the nice thing about the dyno is we've got hard numbers to tell us whether we're making steps forward with our changes or we're taking steps backwards with our changes. So the dyno is, is an absolute must when it comes to really knowing what the, uh, the heck you're doing. So we keep doing that. We keep measuring it. On this particular engine, we dynoed out... Um, not too bad. It was uh, beat the book. The book says 160 horsepower and we'll usually bounce somewhere around 165 to 170 horsepower on, on that engine. And uh, once it's kind of settled out and doing that consistently, we'll call it good. Take it off the dyno and put it in the car. Now on this one and every other one that we've ever done, 356 engine, I don't know why we've been round and round for endless hours trying to figure out why they all have a, just a, a little hesitation around 2800 to 3000 RPM. Well, if we look at the dyno sheets, that's right when we have peak torque, thus peak horsepower. Uh, we never been able to figure it out. I wish I knew. If anybody knows, please fill us in. But we have this kind of slight lag at that RPM. So, anyways, it's been the same on every one we've done, and we've done quite a few of these, um, and I, I really don't know why. I heard that there were some camshafts out there that were not ground properly, and uh, I don't think that's the case in this one because we didn't have that person grind our camshaft, so we really don't know um, about that. But once it gets to this point, we're ready to, uh, if it's on, on a crate, we, we ship them out to the owners, or if it's a restoration here in-house, in it goes. So did Packer do well with this engine? Yes, I do. I think they did very well with this engine. And they did too. They ran it for a long time. But, unfortunately, again, they were slightly behind the curve. By 1949, it was known by Cadillac and many others that really the future lied in V8 overhead cam engines. And in 1949, that's what Cadillac introduced in their car. Well, when you got Cadillac that produced a hell of a good product, competing against Packard, who produced a hell of a good product, but Packard was still building a flathead straight eight engine. There's a lot to be said about inline engines, torque being the main thing. You know, you know a six cylinder engine really is kind of the ultimate engine. Why do you think all these trucks running across America have six cylinder engines in them, 15, even 16 liter engines? Because a six cylinder engine kind of has the perfect dynamic balance. 
Well, a, a V12 would probably be second best in my book and a straight eight after that. But the V8 engine was the wave of the future. General Motors knew it. I think everybody knew it. It's just, did you have the money to come out and develop something new and go on? Well, frankly, Packer didn't. They did pretty good during the war. They made some money on on all of the, the uh, engines that they built for the P51s and all that, but they really didn't have the money, the backing, the, the, the whole infrastructure that General Motors had. And so, once again, by 1949, they were already behind the curve. But they did a great job with these, and a 42 Packard 160 180 is an incredible car, a great car to drive. It's a car you can zip down the road at 65, 70 miles an hour all day long. So a great tour car and fairly reasonably priced today in the marketplace. So my conclusion is they did really good. It just wasn't quite enough. <laughs>